working right now. Sweet. Nice. Yeah. So I, I was just saying, you guys did a wonderful uh, narration about this issue of rationality, how, uh, you know, sort of the foundationalist, the rationalists are thinking about it and how we need to break out of that. Uh, and then how, as you lean into that, you start to intersect with faith. I thought that rocked. So. Yeah. And you wanted to give a, a summary of your conversation about consciousness. Yeah, well, uh, I can certainly give you a, a snippet of where I'm coming from. And then, you know, John and I actually, I think, are uh, complementary each other here. So, you know, my life's work, one way to frame my life's work is on the problem of psychology. Okay. So the problem of psychology, I actually did a blog one a little viral on it just recently. It was, we should know about the problem of psychology in the way we know about the problem of quantum gravity. Okay. And what I mean by that is everyone should be aware that the field of psychology has struggled forever is try to define what the hell it is as a science of, okay? And to this day, it remains, is it a science of mind? Is it a science of behavior? Or is it a science of some combination in therein? And there is no language system uh, that allows you to clarify what is meant by a science of, say, mind and behavior. That's the normal blending, all right? And we should be really conscious of that, um, you know, not to make a pun on words here, <laughs> okay? Uh, and it's right, quite remarkable. I mean, we've known this since 1927. Lev Vygotsky really nails it and uh, calls it the crisis of psychology. Um, never been resolved. And uh, it's at the, to me, it's at the foundation of what I call the enlightenment gap. The enlightenment gap's the modernist inability to develop a language system uh, that's coherent enough uh, to define the necessary terms in the field of relation so that we get coherence. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what my system is about. I'm, you know, what I'm working on is the behavior and mind, mind, mind problem. Okay. And what I mean by that is you have to sort out what is behavior. What do you mean by that? And then there's actually three different definitions of mind that have to be disentangled uh, for you to actually have a language system that then has the appropriate references. And then when you do that, then all of a sudden the field uh, becomes much less tangled and you start to be able to talk with coherence. So the uh, how this uh, and how this dialogues, and that's what Greg and I are doing in each episode, dialogues with the uh, what's called the hard problem of consciousness, is we uh, there's a long argument there. It's very similar in sort of uh, structure to what went on in Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. There's first of all a historical analysis of mm -hmm. how to get to the culture of cognitive grammar that has made this aspect of ourselves that is so familiar and personal so deeply, deeply problematic. And we first of all take a look at sort of the Cartesian arguments. And the main point there is um, the, 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 what's called the mind-body problem, the problem of the relationship between consciousness and our material existence, our physical existence is better said by the way than material, um, is enmeshed. It is woven together with and is inseparable from the cultural cognitive grammar of the scientific revolution. I made similar arguments in Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And then expanding that out, um, and and then sh so how that problem, which is right, what Greg referred to, the generation of uh, of, uh, of the worldview of modernity, uh, is became then enmeshed into what Greg calls the problem of psychology. Is our endeavor to do a lot more work at setting up the problem, formulating the problem of consciousness, really clearly. And what comes out of that is there are there are two issues that tend to be separated in professional academic discourse about consciousness. There's the generation or nature question, which is how does something like consciousness, in, how does it have a place within the physical world as described by science? Like how does it, if one way of putting that, although it's, always, it's also, everything you say about consciousness is contentious, is how does consciousness emerge from the physical world? Um, and Greg and I are, and this is how it also meshes with Greg's work, uh, part of the argument there is, you know, that that's, that question is ill-posed. We should be asking a deeper question of, you know, how does life emerge out of non-life? Um, how does sentience emerge out of animate life? And then how does consciousness emerge? So it's much more of a continuum question than the stark contrast. And then that is put into dialogue with the other question, which is, well, what does consciousness do? I mean, for Descartes, there was no question but because, because he's pre-Freud and pre-Chomsky. But given that most of our intelligent behavior doesn't seem to require consciousness, what is it that consciousness does for us? That's the function question. And the point is we have theories 
cognitive scientific, neuroscientific theories that tend to address one, one of these questions, the nature question, the generation question, or the function question, but not the two together. And part, part of the argument that I'm presenting and, and Greg is uh, helping me with is that that's, that's also a fundamental mistake of analysis. The two questions are deeply integrated. And although it's harder, we have to try and frame them and answer them in an integrated fashion. And then there's a long argument about that, but the main idea is that the function of consciousness is to do, uh, to, to do what I call aspectualization. Um, uh, aspectualization is, out of all the properties, I zero in on the relevant subset of this thing, how they're relevant to each other, and how they're relevant to me. And although I have to say that in three ways, those are all just one relevance realization package. So right now, I, this is a phone, but it could be a weapon, it could be a platform, right? And the point is, I'm always aspectualizing. And then the idea is that aspectualization, which um, is basically a process in which relevance is becoming salient in the sense that it's arousing your investment of your time and your energy, Aspectualization is what makes, so your brain as a, your embodied brain as a physical thing has covariations with the world, right? It has mental states that reliably covary. And that can actually explain a lot of your even unconscious behavior, reliable covariation. The problem with covariation, and this is a standard issue, is that covariation isn't, doesn't have the precision of representation. Right, so the thing in the world that's covariating with this, is it covariating with it as a phone, as a tool, as an object, as a platform, as a potential weapon, as a thing given to me on my birthday, et cetera, right? And so, and this, act, this idea actually comes from Descartes. Many people don't know that, know this. What consciousness does is it takes the reliable covariations that give us our rudimentary intelligence, our big ability to respond in a reliably, reliably discriminatory variable fashion with the variations of the world. And what it does is it aspectualizes them for us. And when they're aspectualized, they're now ready for reason. They're ready for, and I'm meaning that very broadly. And Greg is being charitable with me on that. So, right. Uh, the, I, the, the, I, I love the frame. I can frame, you know, what, I love it. Yeah, no, it's good. Right. And so um, the idea is that that's one of the main functions of re, uh, consciousness. That's why consciousness is so needed in situations where we're facing novelty, complexity, or ambiguity, because aspectualization is needed. And what I can show, and I'm not gonna do it here because there's too much, not enough time, is most of the functional accounts, that I've made this argument elsewhere, most of the current functional accounts of consciousness actually converge on this idea of consciousness as this kind of higher order, relevance realization, aspectualization, that readies us for reason in a powerful way. Now what that also, gives, I would argue, is it also starts to explain the phenomenology. Why? Well, what does aspectualization give, give you? Well, it gives you what I call the adverbial qualia. It gives you the here-ness and the now-ness and the togetherness, the adverbial qualia. And the problem that has sort of hamstrung a lot of discourse about consciousness is that we overfocus on the adjectival qualia, the greenness, the blueness, and what's coming, uh, what it, it, and, what it, and I'm not going to say that those aren't part of consciousness, of course they are, but the adverbial qualia are actually qualia, and they can actually be, so they're part of the nature of consciousness, it's what it's like to be conscious, but they are directly explicable in terms of the functionality. Now, what might that do for you? Well, it might help to account for the fact that you can actually have states of consciousness in which there are no adjectival qualia. You can be in the pure conscious event that's achieved in deep, but what doesn't go away are the adverbial qualia, the here-ness and the now. That's why like the, these, these states are described with superlatives of here-ness and now-ness, eternity and unity, ultimate togetherness. So the adverbial qualia are, seem to be both necessary and sufficient for consciousness. And that, uh, that seems to be, um, there's more to this, I'm just giving you a gist. Now, what this ultimately leads to is this idea. You have participatory knowing that set up the reliable covariation and generate affordances. And then you have, right, this higher order relevance realization 
that is right that is doing the aspectualization, and that gives me my perspectival knowing. And consciousness is my participatory knowing of and through my perspectival knowing. That's why when I'm conscious, I'm not only what's it like, it's also who I am. I know I'm conscious by being conscious. And so I'm trying to give an account that in an integrated fashion explains the functionality and the phenomenality of consciousness. And it also helps to explain a deep intuition that is presupposed but never addressed through all of this literature, that we attribute consciousness where we, where we have evidence for intelligence. People reliably do that. Well, here's a reason why. Because there's a deep continuity and functional relationship between the relevance realization that gets the covariation going and the higher order relevance realization that aspectualizes that and readies it for reason. Boom. That's it. <laughs> and that, of course, everything I said, pretty much every single sentence, needs argument and evidence. And what Greg and I are doing is unpacking the argument and the evidence for all right. of that. Right. Nice. So, so yeah, for me, that all of that fits. Uh, it all fits in my unified theory frame. Uh, it, and so what John is doing, so, so very quickly, I, I said there are three different really meanings of the word mind, mental process, okay? So one meaning, what I call mind one, uh, that's a neurocognitive functional account of mental behavior. I'll say that again, it's a neurocognitive functional account of mental behavior. So what you do there is you see an animal behaving. I got fish over there, I go up, I feed them. Every time I feed them, they get all excited, okay? Why? Well, there's a classical and operant associative relationship and I can analyze the hierarchical structure of their nervous system, relate it to the contingencies of the environment and analyze the animal behavioral patterns in relationship to that. Uh, where the cognitive refers to the information instantiated within the nervous system and the mental, overt mental behavior refers to what I see. So that's a pure science externalized view, mm -hmm. right? And that's what some people mean when they talk about mind. It's like, oh, that's the, that's the neurocognitive structure that are regulating and controlling behavior. That's one definition. And then you then divide it up into all the stuff inside the brain, the informational architecture, and then how it's regulating the stuff outside that's between the animal and the environment. That's what I call mental behavior because you have to have that actual specifier because atoms behave, cells behave, but they don't behave as mental entities. Okay. Then what you get is mind two of an emergent function, which is essentially conscious phenomenology. What John's theory is of is of the processes by which uh, that neurocognitive architecture comes together, engages in perspectival and participatory knowing. Uh, that's mind two. Now, mind two is funky, okay, and really challenging, especially in the language of science, because it's you can't see it, right? It's epistemologically contained, unlike mind one, which is epistemologically available from a science perspective. Mind two is epistemologically across uh, the gap of first and second person, okay? And that's a nightmare, and that's, that's why science has fucking tumbled over it. But then you get mind three. Okay, mind three is human justification. We just listened to John's mind three give us a narrative about his theory of consciousness, right? Now, the cool thing about mind three is that goes between across the skin without a boundary, all right? So the information contained in my head as I talk and throughs my skin, so it's actually intersubjectively available from interior exterior positions. So mind one is available through the exterior and it's classic neurocognitive behavioral position. Mind two is phenomenology consciousness. And then how does that work, which is John's fundamental theory and actually lines right up with the unified theory with enormous specificity and precision. And John's got some brilliant insight. That ad adjectival versus adverbial shift, my mind went boom when I saw mine, that. Mine just did. <laughs> I mean, when you just brought it up, the first time I, I heard like, that. What the? I was like, oh my God, it's the witnessing function and what you're witnessing together and you split those things and then you can have a pure consciousness event as you find in meditation, which means then the quality will go away, but you're still present with the hereness now and this. Um, uh, it's, it's boom, you know? So now you actually then hone in, you split that thing off. And my whole, the first thing that I stumbled on in 1996 was the justification hypothesis and theory, which is what is the mind three? What is the fundamental organization of human mind three? You guys were talking about rationality last time. And I wanted to jump in there and say, Hey, actually guys use justification and then split it across personal and social and analytic. And you will be able to manage your rationality narrative there. Um, uh, that's another conversation. But anyway, mind three is a totally different ballgame. 
because it cuts right through the skin. So we got to divide up mind three, mind two, mind one. And then there's a whole another argument for what behavior is. But you do that, we start talking with a level of specificity and clarity uh, that's never been achieved. And then, and, and then the implications of that are hard to overstate. So we probably, I hope, Jordan, we haven't, I mean, you, you have an amazing capacity to take a lot of complex information. Um, but I hope that wasn't like right, bunch of we're geeking out here, so we'll shut up. <laughs> a little bit. No, that was great. Yeah, that was fantastic. I liked all of it. Um, um, mm -hmm. No, yeah. So, so thank you. And it'll take me a little while, I think. To there's some eddies, like the the adjective adverb, um, that I, you know I can feel them already doing stuff. I am changing as a consequence of that. That was a new thing, and it's real. Like it's a good thing. Um, and just FYI, I just like to flag uh, the 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 debabilization move that I think is consistently showing up here that is so powerful. You need specificity and clarity, like the disambiguation. It's like, hey guys, a lot of the problem here is actually just the grammar. A lot yes. of the problem is the is right. the is the things we're using to try to do to figure stuff out. Yeah. Let's slow down. Let's get the tools in order. Let's get things clear. Once we get to clarity, a lot of the problems go away. And those that don't go away, we can actually now begin to address. Um, yeah, so it's really interesting. And I was noticing, Greg, I just had in my mind, it popped into my mind as you're, as you're talking at that last step, um, the systems of justification, the, the, the visual image of the tree, because mm -hmm. it's of course three, mm -hmm. it, it, you have the trunk. It's, mm -hmm. it's all, it's all of this is happening in the context of still the deep fundamental connectedness to the whole of real and the way the whole of real is kind of coming up in these stacks, right? So I've got this mind three, which is sitting enmeshed in mind two, which is sitting enmeshed in mind one, which is sitting enmeshed in, you know, all the way down to then, you know, mm -hmm. reality and fully constrained by the constraints that give rise to that being a coherent structure all the way up. And then it has its own novel or specifics of what right. it's doing in, the, in that environment. It opens up a lot of adjacent possibles when you right. shift into that language yeah, or that, different I, information processing. That, 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 yeah, that, yeah. So uh, one one argument, in fact, uh, about the uh, one of the new theories. And again, I won't go. I, I'm not going to try and burden people because Greg and I are going to unpack this in detail. But one of the more more re most recent um, and promising theories of uh, the function of consciousness um, does agrees with that the idea of consciousness is this aspectualization. Um, and, and, and and but they also bring out uh, an important, uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I, I realized it was funny. They're going to bring out an important aspect of the aspectualization. <laughs> uh, but what's that aspect? Um, and here, this is even tightening this idea about readying up for reason. I mean, aspectualization is what turns covariations into representation. And representations through their specificity can become truth bearers. And that's needed for reason. But what aspectualization all, also does, and what consciousness seems to be specifically needed for, is dealing with counterfactuals. Unconscious cognition doesn't seem to be able to deal with counterfactuals, mm. right? And so what you're getting in the readiness for reason is of course you're getting representations, which are truth bearers, right? But there are unconscious representations, but when they are aspectualized such that they can enter into counterfactual consideration, then you have genuine readiness for reason. Now, of course, that's gonna just be adaptively important and of course, when you recurse that on yourself, you get a needed capacity for self-correction because self-correction presupposes I should have done X, which is a counterfactual. Right. So that, right? I'll just add a quick comment sure. to that. So uh, just so you were tracking here. So when he says ready for reason, uh, we're talking still at an animal level. And for me, then we're actually talking then about, okay, ready for simulation across yeah. possible paths of investment. And that's where the counterfactual will come up. So you're sort of like, okay, hmm, I can now hold. And by the way, this is then connects into what's called working memory, uh, perspectival working memory. So how does the thing hold and then run through various simulations of possibility yeah. and then make comparison of relationship to possible paths of investment and create a cost benefit analysis of the affordances that you want to then track, okay? So then what happens is that's happening at the mammal level, okay, or birds, a lot, you know, where exactly is and all that's super crazy in the animal world, but essentially that's what's going on, right? And then actually I want to then say, yeah, and then there's an extra ready for reason that we do when we yeah. actually start talking to each other, yeah. right? Which then said, well, how the hell do you know you're not bullshitting me? <laughs> you know, it's right. like, you can yeah, so there we are. Yeah. Right? And then you're sort of like, now I'm going to justify. Now it's like, why do you, you know, now you have propositional language that's actually tracking the simulation. 
right? And then you have the question of the proposition. Now you have propositional knowledge on top of perspectival participatory knowledge, and then exactly. boom. Right. So, so what you're talking about, as I understand it, is something along the lines of the the location in justification justification space of what we might call reason two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So, which within the mind three kind of reasoning versus mind two kind of reasoning, right? Which is simulation. We do that all the time. You imagine, you simulate various outcomes, right? But it's not necessarily propositional. Then you get into propositional knowing, okay? And then what you what we got was initially personal and social indigenous justification. And then when we get in the pre-modern formal, and most notably Socrates, you actually get formal analytic epistemological justification, which is, well, how do you know you're not just fucking bullshitting? It's like, is it, here's math, mathematical truths are like this, that's, that's, that's deductive truths. Do we have deductive truth systems that we're actually making, or we're all just making this up a bunch of, uh, for our social needs? And then now all of a sudden you get philosophy and boom, real. Uh, huh. huh. So this implies, by the way, how neat. I, I believe that we just hit, uh, we, this implies that when you've achieved a particular level of distributed cognition, mm -hmm. that you've achieved a capacity to actually have distributed relevance realization, yes. you will also have witnessed the emergence of shared consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to be, that, that, I think that's right. A whole bunch of new age people just had a very weird feeling, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that one, dude. Not not that not, one. No, yeah. no, no. We're 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 talking yeah, right. We're, we're playing jazz here, folks. You know, okay, uh, that kind of. But that's like that's you can disambiguate. You can de babbleize that. Okay. What I just that, said that, is exactly that, what is implied. But just now you have to grasp it with the right I, language. I think your point about so this is actually you uh, your de babbleization thing resonates enormously with me. That's what I've been fucking obsessed with. Because in 1990s, I realized I was, I was equivocating. I love John's word about equivocating. Mm -hmm. Equivocation, I, yeah. I, was really, I realized that I was, like, I was getting driven by something crazy, and I didn't have the word equivocate, but that was the issue. I didn't know what I was talking about. I'd listen to other people, and they didn't know what the hell they were talking about. I mean, they knew within their little frames, but the frames didn't line up, so they were arguing about stuff that couldn't be corresponded to each other. So it was like, what's the point? You know? So anyway, that's, a, that's been my obsession for a long damn time. Let's... Let, I, so, sorry, I want to make sure you're, you're done, Greg, because I know that's an important I'm done. Yep. Sorry. You're also my friend, and I want to make sure that I, 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 I'm being... I'm being <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, don't worry about a friend of me, brother. <laughs> yeah. So about that, about shared consciousness, I mean, Dan Chappie and I are doing a lot of work on this because with, about the rovers on Mars and the scientists working together to move the rovers around. And that's where a lot of this stuff about uh, participatory and perspectival knowing uh, really comes to the fore. But let, let's try something. Let's, let's move into that carefully because I don't want to make the New Agers happy, uh, but I do want to perhaps make us uh, ready for the next uh, paradigmatic place. Uh, so, uh, so let's take, take a look at what we were saying about, notice you know, how we use these two terms. We sort of had awareness of the world perception, and then we had imagination. And we talk about working memory here. But the thing that we're now realizing in cognitive sciences, those are not, right, we sort of think of them as different, but they're actually interwoven like this, right? And this is all what's going on in what's called predictive process. Imagination is just the, is just the top down aspect of realization and perception is just the bottom up aspect of it. And you can pull them apart uh, in certain ways, but notice how consciousness is bridging between them. Because when I'm, Doing this on the world, I'm conscious. But when I'm doing this in my head, you know what I still am? Conscious. And consciousness is exactly that bridging, right? That allow that we're, right? We're bringing into sort of a meta cognitive awareness, the, the way we can play with the relationship between the top down and the bottom up of aspectualization. Now, something analogous to that, I think can go on. And I, 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 I wanna be really clear that I'm making an analogy here. Something can go on in what is called, you know, the social imaginary, the, the kind of shared, um, well, we've talked about this, the paradigmatic images and exemplars that constitute a paradigm. And then from that, you know, the, the groups of people have shared awareness of objects and relations in the world. And there's something analogous, it's not a consciousness, but there's something analogous to consciousness moving between the social imaginary and the socially shared awareness. And that is doing something very much like what you said, Jordan. It's doing relevance realization 
It's managing relevance realization at this, at the level of distributed cognition. So while I don't think that's a consciousness, I think there is something analogous to that going on at the distributed cognitive level. And that part of what we could be seeing the potential of is a simultaneous restructuring of what that, whatever we want to call that is, and what's going on in here. Because we, we, we always think that this is the way it's always been for us, our experience of consciousness. The Greeks don't have a word for consciousness. It doesn't exist for them the way it exists for us as a phenomenon, right? And so the, we can, we, it's quite likely we are, have the potential to radically transform that outer, I don't know what to call it, I don't want to call it consciousness, but that outer analog of consciousness and the inner experience of consciousness in a very profound way. And I sometimes think, Jordan, and I hope you've, you find this complimentary and, and, and not insulting, I sometimes think that, I sometimes use that a way of trying to understand what you're talking about when you're talking about coherence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that feels right. The word, that word just kept coming up for me. And, you know, Greg's used the, that particular word a yeah. few times in the, in the past, in, 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 the, in the past few moments. And there's a, a strong coordination there. So it's almost like, you know, I'm using the word coherence at the level of distributed cognition. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the way that he's using the, level, the word coherence in the, at the level of mind, uh, I believe, mind two. Right, and so the the challenge is to say, okay, how do you actually enable coherence at the level of I think mind three? I may not be using that term just right. Yep, no, um, that's right. Is yeah, that right? So, yeah, so so here's so mind three then is what it is that starts to connect us on a highway of information. Okay, yeah. and then that's a that then rises us from primates into people. Okay, that highway of information, that capacity to justify, that creates indigenous knowledge. Okay. And then ultimately we start building civilizations. Then we get much more material control and voila. And, but we get then the evolution of cultural knowledge, which are these systems of justification that build upon each other. All right. And so when it, we do, we get plugged into Cartesian dualism in a particular kind of way, right? That the Greeks didn't. So our relationship to ourselves, our relation, I think that Shakespeare opened up a soliloquy to ourself, yes. right? Right. In a totally different way. So we're getting this, all this mind, Mind three is kind of a blank slate. It's waiting to absorb. It's an organ of culture. It's waiting to absorb the narrative and then bring you all online. And then we feed those of you feed back on it. Okay. Yeah. You know? And so, and what you were talking, when you guys were talking, remember the singularity conversation, you, you, you riffed off the singularity paper I gave, right? And you instantaneously recognized that we were changing paradigms, right? Accelerating paradigms in space change systems. So what we are actually seeing is this paradigmatic you know, flux, crazy flux, right? Those paradigms are these, uh, the, the center of these paradigms are systems of justification, okay? Look at what Peter Lindbergh did with Culture 2.0. He, he gets that table, he gets the archetypal justification, the anti-justification, the leaders that create the paradigm. This is what I stand for. This is my investment pattern. These are my people. This is what I'm against, right? um, And what's happened is, is that, Technology, intersection, and information is completely outstripping any paradigm that has for sense-making capacity, which is driving the system insane. And what we're actually trying to do is, is there a meta position of all of this crazy paradigm that we could do without babble and not in some top-down authoritarian way, but actually sense-make so then we could actually have sovereignty so we can network ourselves together and right this ship before it fucking collapses. At least that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, so the, the map to, to me hold this, because I'm, I'm following you completely, but I want to make sure that it's actually being held more broadly. Um, and I'm not sure if this metaphor is going to work, but just to kind of do the two to three, just keep moving back mm -hmm. and forth. Yep. You know, if, if I talk about coherence at the level of mind, I guess mind one and two, there's something that happens mm -hmm. there. You know, something like an epileptic seizure is a really nice, clean example of what happens when that coherence breaks down. Okay. There's a series of feedback loops, of signaling structures and mechanisms of an inhibition and excitation that when the neurocognitive architecture is coherent, it works, right? right. It produces a, uh, a set of emergent properties that are available in this new space called mind two that can generate behaviors and counterfactuals and all that kind of stuff, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. right now, what we're sort of witnessing in mind three is the equivalent, the moral equivalent of an epileptic seizure because we don't yet have the kinds of signaling structures and inhibition and excitatory feedback loops to maintain coherence. 
if we can't attain coherence, then something locks at that point and we're doing something new on that substrate. hundred percent. Can't, it couldn't have said it better. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that lines up with what, what I, what I've been trying mm -hmm. to articulate too, or at least the project I'm concerned with, and I've seen it right. as constantly in resonance. Well, I mean, project. right. So John, aren't we trying to distribute deal logos to bring people together in interpersonal participatory right. harmony, right? And then pull the logic so that our propositional systems align. And right. then if we can extract a particular kind of justifiable knowledge, right? And then hone in around that to create some sort of integrated pluralism that gives people enough distributed cognition of where they're going, but has enough integration so that there's a degree of clarity and coherence and harmony. So like that, that's the infrastructure to hold the emergent system in a way that's at least puts the constraints on it, that allows it to grow, but doesn't predetermine what you can't predetermine in this kind of uh, emergent flux. I agree with all of that, Craig, except I would add to it, and I think it goes with it well, is that dialogus is not just argumentation, it's drama. There's right. also, right, you have to, all the perspectival and participatory knowing mm -hmm. has to be transformed through some enacted symbolism, right? If that's what's going on in dialogus. And, and well. Exactly, and that's so consistent. Why the hell did I turn this goddamn thing into a garden, right? right. And a car cartoon, as my dad said, that's a fucking cartoon, you know? It's like, but it's like this art, I was, an, I was a humanistic calling, and I was doing all science, like, of course, I'm a practitioner as well, but I'm trying to bridge, and all of a sudden, it's like, the next transformation is going to have to have that synthesis of science and humanities is going to have to embrace the entire totality of human experience. We can't have a master and his emissary, uh, you know, break as we did in the 20th century. We've got to bring back participatory knowing. We've got to bring back the entire thing. has got to come around. And it's a transition then into humanities and, and creating that synthesis. And so is it, is it, I mean, I've, I've got three things that are sort of coming up as being the, well, necessary, and I don't know if they're sufficient. So, so one has to do with, I guess there's the two faces of bullshit. One is the inner facing, the other is the outer facing. So mm -hmm. don't bullshit yourself and yep. don't bullshit me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then the third has to do with this, the, the grammar. And you know, just be very careful to not, um, hmm, what's the, I, it's funny, if there's a recursion here, isn't it? Self-referentiality. Um, be very careful to not equivocate be very careful to achieve clarity in the communications methodology yes. and be very aware of when and where I have to speak a little faster, unfortunately, because it's coming too quickly. Um, when a niche for bullshit has opened up in the ambiguity of the communications methodology. Yes. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. And, and, the, and the, why that's particularly dangerous and requires us to be careful and full of care, let's use both senses of that word, careful and full of care, um, is that the, what we're talking about here is not a, a static grasping of what is, but an aspiration, right, to transformation. And the mm -hmm. problem with transformation is it moves you into non-logical identity. It takes you out of, and I've made this argument before, you can't infer your way through ra radical transformation. It doesn't work. So that's why we have narrative. Narrative trains us in non-logical identity, right? It trains, it, so you can look at the picture of yourself as a four-year-old and go, there I am, which is like, <laughs> what? Right? And you just do it without thinking because narrative has trained you in non-logical identity. And symbol trains you in non-logical. And you have to teach kids all of this. And we teach them in, in dialogue how to do this. We're training them in non-logical identity because that is what affords them. It opens up the counterfactual space and makes it transformatively available to them. They can ident they can go through aspirational transformation. But the problem is non-logical identity superficially looks like contradiction, looks like ambiguity, looks like equivocation. And so that is particularly ripe for bullshit. That right there. That's why I'm engaging in, for me, this whole project of Dialogos and all of these wonderful conversations, because I think this is about trying to simultaneously create the new cultural cognitive grammar, but also afford the transformations, right? A perspective on participatory knowing that hone my skills and virtues so I can distinguish and discern between the bullshit 
and the, no, the non-logical identity of transformation. Mm, thanks. So good. Yeah. So it's, remember we've used that language. I think I've, I've talked about it in terms of like, does it, does the thing rotate this way or does it rotate that way? And you've talked about it in terms of reciprocal closing and reciprocal opening. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like if, if you've got your stack upside down, Mm. So that relevance realization is no longer grounding you to the whole of reality. Mm -hmm. You're in deep trouble in exactly this location. Yeah. And what I was just doing, by the way, is I was just like as much as possible, just like seating myself in the stack, being in the right direction, listening right. to you and noticing like how the, the felt sense of, of relevance realization was like guiding my and yeah. orienting and making you do that aspectalization of what was happening. So I was able to yeah. orient on exactly the right thing. Okay. And everything was saying, yes, 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 yes. We were definitely, I didn't have to worry about the propositional stuff hanging together because I was safe in the space of the exploration of the emergent possible when you actually open things up. But if you're not grounded in your, in your relevance realization, um, and, and particularly if you're topsy turvy, then opening that thing up is, is, you know, well, it's going to be a real problem. Absolutely, man. So, and you said, Jordan, you said something, you know, super simple, but also super profound that I want to come back to you. Like, bullshit self, bullshit other. Okay. So in the unified theory, you have your private narrator, mind three. All right. And then you sit on top of that, your mind two experiential self that then embeds itself in its mind one. Okay. The mind one into mind two is, you know, I use the short end. Well, I'll be dialogue with John about this. It's called the attentional filter, okay, which basically is shorthand for all the stuff John's talking about. I'll bring stuff in, relevance, realization, bring it into perspectival knowing, and, you know, and we'll be dealing with that. Then you have the narrator that's, that's then that narrator is going to bullshit self, okay? And I call that the Freudian filter, all right? Because that self needs to be like, hey, I'm a good person, you know? Uh, and needs to believe that it's doing the right thing and it's internalized mom and dad's rules and is a good thing, living it up, blah, blah, blah. And we know cognitive dissonance is all about that. Maintaining a justified state of being. And you can analyze this empirically. It's unbelievably robust. And then there's the private to public filter. You know, what I call the Rogerian filter because I'm a clinician, but it's also lying and bullshit. Or what you're trying to do to just maintain the public image and not avoid, you know, avoid the judgment of other. Okay. So then you bullshit, say, oh, yeah, I love that sweater, or oh, God, I'm the, whatever the fuck you want, right? You know, so you love me, and I get social influence. So it is learning that calibration at the social and personal level. How do you calibrate bullshit self, bullshit other? And then we have the whole analytic problem, and, and we, we've inherited grammars that are not fucking up to the task, and so now we get this whole issue of like, well, good luck actually trying to make sense when your forefathers fucking can't make sense. <laughs> You know, you're not handed the grammar that's needed in the situation you find yourself in, or at least we have to rediscover and re-put together uh, philosophically. And we, we get that right. We get the analytic, we get the social, we get the personal. Uh, and we're at least aware of that, and we come into harmony with that. And the right wow. logos, fucking name. You know, it's, it's really cool. Um, I don't know if, if, you, if this is something you do, but if you, if you run a, a, a simulation um, on... Every, do you guys, you guys are familiar with the term with the ESS, right? The evolutionarily stable strategy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, th that which is not an ESS is uh, self-terminating. And if you, if you run it out long enough, it, it goes to the null, it evaporates. So I, I just ran a little micro simulation on that. So I would like to propose that every single strategy that is not on the line that you're describing, which is to say every single strategy that, in, that is on the line of self-bullshit, every single strategy that is on the line of other bullshit, uh, is a is self terminating. This is uh, Whitehead's claim. He says yeah. that our one hope is that evil is ultimately self destructive. Yeah, I, I'm going to propose that I, I can I can prove it. Uh, although I don't know that I can prove it in propositional language just yet. Right. I, I think wisely we know that that's true over time. I will say, you know, villains. You know, you know, in their lives, <laughs> they get away with shit. Well, this is the problem, right? We, right? we have a, we, humans have yeah. a time horizon. You know, if, if, if your civilization, every single civilization collapses, but they all collapse in a thousand years, <laughs> you've got like, you know, 15 generations that are like, yeah, it's cool. What are you talking about? And then those, those last few generations are like confused. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Why is, why is everything getting worse? I don't get it. Right. And then, and then you have this horrible crisis and everybody just sort of loses their minds. Right. History becomes utterly lost. Grammar becomes, you know, put into a, into a blender. 
And then you kind of reboot on this new basis and you start again. You're like, oh, wait, okay, we're cool. So it has to do, I think, a little bit with time horizons that are- Right, are, exactly. It, it dumps entropic externalities into the shit of the system and that's going to back it up eventually. Right, exactly. And that's going to back it up eventually. And so you end up with, there will be a reckoning Mm -hmm. um, but there are ways to sort of you might die reckoning. in advance of that <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's like you the know, inverse of the guy but, who plants but, the tree but, shady's you know, not going to be in right exactly <laughs> but we want to I, I i was participating in a big history conference and it was be a good ancestor that's what it that's what it that was the title of it I was like yes you know you want to extend yourself in time you want to be on the right side of history be a damn good ancestor. don't leave your bullshit you know to your future self don't leave it to others and don't leave it to your kids yeah, and so here's the other piece of it. I think this other piece is also super, super important, um, which is to say that the good news, and it's like the best possible news, is that, and also, so we're not saying don't eat cotton candy, eat broccoli. I wish to say we're, we're not saying defer your local quality of well-being in exchange for people you'll never know. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's, a, that's a thing, but it's not the right thing. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying, at least, and I believe that we will all collectively say is, and also this particular location, this, 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 this spot in justification space mm -hmm. also happens to be the location that has the highest possible meaningfulness of your present being in the world. Yeah, and really. so mm -hmm. you get the thing that is actually the thing that is the most valuable mm -hmm. in your life while you are alive and happen also simultaneously to be participating in that thing that is most enduring will actually can not is not self-terminating. Yep. So when Kant Kant talks about well-being, essentially he's got a wonderful summary of it. It's, it's happiness with the worthiness to be happy. Okay. So so when you're bullshitting, you're cutting away at that worthiness, right? So it's that it's that dialectic. It's you know, yes, we want happiness. And don't do it, don't, you know, you're losing it if you're sacrificing it without integrity, you know, if you're bullshitting to get there. It's worthiness to be. And it is that di that's a dialectic of that gets into that integrity piece and holding them. I think that's uh, bringing up Kant and happiness is a great segue then for me because I think this is one of the most bullshitty words we have in our culture right now, which is happiness. Oh, God. Mm. <laughs> I know. That's a, <laughs> I usually hate it, but when I stumble across the Kantian uh, edition, I was like, all right, I can now bring this term back. <laughs> so, you know, the Greeks have multiple terms for it, uh, as they always do, where we have one. I often feel like we're four-year-olds with our clunky terms and the Greeks have these. Same thing with love. I mean, holy shit. Yeah, yeah well, right. love and, and, and wisdom. We have one word. They have Sophia. They have Provisus, right. right? So anyways, so sort of the modern stuff on, or the, the, the recent stuff on this seems to be going this way. Like I said, there's a lot of conceptual confusion, but there's a parsing that I think is emerging and, and to take happiness and to pull it apart from three things that we put together, success, subjective well-being, and meaning in life. And they can all, and they are not identical because they can vary independently from each other. You do need a certain amount of success in order to have subjective well-being. Subjective well-being is a sense of the autonomy and competence and connectedness of the self. It sort of solidifies the self, right? That, 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 that's what subjective well-being is. And, and if, you don't, if you're in poverty or if you're oppressed, you, right? If you don't have enough success in your life, then you don't have good subjective well-being. The thing is, though, and this is what the research shows, once you get out of poverty, right, then huge changes in wealth and power only bring small changes in subjective well-being. So after a certain stage, success and subjective well-being peel apart from each other. Well, they said, oh, then but isn't what ultimately matters is subjective well-being. No. Because subjective well-being is not the same thing as meaning in life. Meaning in life is about ultimately mattering to an intelligible order that is greater than yourself. That's why you can, right? And so that's why what goes down when you have a kid? Subjective well-being. Why do people do it? Because meaning in life goes up, right? And so what we have to understand is that when we're proposing what you're proposing, I, well, I'm proposing to you, Jordan, that when we say to people, look, you know, commit, well, first of all, mattering to an intelligible order than greater than you, that is actually meaning in life. And, 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 and joy is not the same thing as subjective well-being. Subjective well-being is, is the positive sense that yourself has been solidified and strengthened. Joy is the sense of losing yourself in something beyond yourself, like in awe and wonder. 
And what we have to under, what we have to get people to see is, look, you should, and this is like, you know, the stuff I'm doing with the Epicureans in the, in the, in the morning Sanger classes, you have to prioritize these in the right way. You shouldn't identify them and you have to prioritize them in the right way. It's like Maslow's hierarchy in some ways. You gotta mm -hmm. get enough success so that you've got enough subjective well-being. But you know what you ultimately really want? You ultimately want meaning in life. Because those other, all of those first two reliably go down with old age. And we, many people think that's why they're terrified of old age, because they can reliably and accurately predict success and subjective well-being are gonna go down. But you know, if you measure old people, older people, they actually are much happier than us. How can that be? Because their meaning in life is going up tremendously because they have, in general, we're talking probabilistically, not individually, they have more wisdom and they have more sense of mattering to things beyond themselves. Mm -hmm. And so we have to pull apart. Happiness, this, this notion we have of happiness is one of the most bullshitty things we have right now. And we have to pull them apart Right, we, the babble around that, uh, the seventh branch, the one with the red circle on that, that's an analysis of what well-being is. Uh, it, that's, uh, and, mm -hmm. and what John's talking about is like, uh, how do we non-equivocate on what the fuck do we mean by well-being? And a lot of what John said is it would be embedded in that uh, analysis. But yeah, yeah, and make sure that what we seek is well-being is the argument, and then a rich analysis of what the components of well-being <laughs> are. Sorry, I was... I my, my mind went a little bit of an eddy, but I think it might be useful. Um, so I was thinking about the fact of the good news. Mm -hmm. And then as we were talking, I was then thinking, oh, yeah, and there's also bad news. Uh, so the, the good news is, is that like, wow, we're really, we've actually got some pretty seriously high quality stuff. Like there's actually um, a lot of hard questions uh, if you're able to not bullshit yourself, not bullshit others, and then move skillfully through clarity. Um, we can, we can make some good ground. The bad news is it's really, really fucking hard to do brain surgery in the middle of an epileptic season. <laughs> that is the fucking... <laughs> <laughs> I've wept a couple of times at night with that basic realization. So I agree. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I, and this is where I often part company from my religious friends. Uh, and, and certain of my ideological friends, because I do not believe there's a T loss to history. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have that kind of faith. And, and, um, and that's why I'm also very suspicious of utopian visions, etc. So that's where I would say to you, Jordan, that, yeah, doing it while you're having the epileptic seizure, uh, when, 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 like, like myself, I'm just speaking for myself, but perhaps also for you guys, but when you don't believe that there's any inevitable T loss, um, then it's, yeah, I think we, that's why the discussion we're all having about a reinventio of faith and reason and continuity of contact and wisdom is so important because I, I guess for me, what else is there? Mm -hmm. What else is there that we can do? Um, I, I agree with you, Jordan. It's a race, and there's I I I I actually think the probabilities are, are against us, but I think the moral argument is we've got to try our best, and even if we fail, maybe we can light enough candles so mm. that there'll be enough light for the next group of people. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. how. That's what I. Mm -hmm. that, I, I I like Taru in uh, Albert Camus' The Plague. I want to know how to be a saint without God, uh, at least the, the every the common conception of God. And so for me, that's, that's how I think of it. It's like, yes, it's, the probabilities are we're gonna lose, but the moral argument is, well, we, there's, we have to try our best with the best people that we can and with the best skills we have. And even if we fail, if we do a good enough job that maybe we have sufficed enough, satisfied enough that we've lit enough candles so there's enough light for the next group of people. Well, and, and I, would say, I would say the same thing, but from the interior of that, which is um, if you're operating in this way, what you discover is that there is no other way to operate. Yes. So I don't have to imagine a telos. I don't have to imagine a better future. All I have to do is act in the way that I know is the right way to act. And I will in fact do, there's a perfect isometry. And I mean, perfect. They are identical. They are the same thing. They're just looking at them from two different perspectives. Mm -hmm. well, I agree with that. I think that's well said. That, and that to me, I mean, McClellan in his book on the wisdom of vacation talks about, you know, the three degrees. You start with the Epicureans, 
that's like primary school. And then you move into the uh, uh, high school, that's the Stoics. And then you move into university, that's the Neoplatonists. But what you just said about that, that's, that's, that's a very Stoic thing, right? The, mm -hmm. the, 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 right? Um, and um, yeah. So I agree with that. We're fucked, guys. Let's just go get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> it was, now, I mean, you know, what? <laughs> that's right. I mean, you know, there it is. You know what? You, you were in this trajectory and yeah, I'm scared as shit, you know. Um, but what you said, Jordan, and what you both said, I mean, what you're now all of a sudden when you wake up in a particular way and you're aligned in a particular way, then it just unfolds in some ways. I mean, just because like the virtue, like Aristotle talked about in terms of you cultivate a particular kind of line of virtue. Uh, and the structure essentially starts to unfold itself. This is yeah. Sofrasun. This, this is the virtue that we do not have a word for. Because Sofrasun is to have this, this, you know, this training of your Stanley's landscaping so that you are, you are tempted. Hmm. You are tempted to the good. What it's, is it, Sofrasun? I actually, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's, what's, it's one of the cardinal virtues. And hmm. it's usually oh, translated. Shit. <laughs> I should probably know it then. <laughs> it's, it's usually translated as moderation but it doesn't mm. capture it, or temperance, which doesn't capture it. In fact, many people have tried to argue that the, maybe the closest thing we now have in our culture for software is something closer like mindfulness. Uh, McGee argues that in his book. So I don't translate it. Sofferson, and Sofferson is in contrast to Inkratia. Inkratia is, you know, Kratia, the, the, the most Kratia, the power of the people, and Kratia is, in, is to exert power on yourself. So you, this is when you're restraining yourself, like, don't take the cake, don't take the cake. Yes. Right, but well, Sofrasin, right. But, but wait, Sofrasin is is the is like is to 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 be just not is to be naturally tempted to the good. Right, it's, right. This is the difference between the Kantian and Aristotle vision of morality. Right. That's right. A, I mean, Kant's view, the deontological view, is you have to cultivate the discipline to control the yeah. sin, essentially, and the strength of morality is the ability to regulate that, in essence. And the Aristotle view is to figure out a way to train the system so that they are aligned toward the virtue, so that there is un they are in harmony. Right? That's what I mean. And, 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 and notice the weird aspirational nature of temptation, the poor breath of out. When you're tempted to do evil, who's tempting you? It's some aspect of you, and, right? It's aspirational, but it's, a, it's an aspiration that reciprocally narrows. But we can train aspiration that tempts us to reciprocal opening. That's software. And if we crack the bullshit equation, right, to help people understand why their animalistic shit starts and then they can rationalize and then bullshit and we can, you know, the ability to actually align that thing with insight um, seems that we can do better. Yeah. I think what you said a few minutes ago really I hadn't put it, but putting those together, Socrates and Stoicism, because I, it always bothered me that the Stoics said that what they wanted to do was, and, and Nietzsche, this pissed Nietzsche off, that it, 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 was to, it was to, you know, to flow with nature. And, and it was like, what? And Nietzsche regs on, a, 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 right? But I, what you just said, Jordan, right? If we get into a state where we are Socrates, where we're Socratesenic, right? We, we, feel, we feel naturally aligned in ourselves and then we feel naturally aspirationally aligned to the good. And then that's to always flow towards the good. And I think it just made, I just go to, oh, that's it. That's what they're talking about. That's what they're trying to put their finger on. And they use, and, and people don't get this because they think of Stoicism as this dour thing. The word, one of the words that's most frequently used by the Stoics to describe what they're after, and the name brings this out in his book, is joy. Stoicism is supposed to result in joy not in Kratia, but Sophrosynic joy. Yeah, it's funny. I, I feel like I could, uh, I could give uh, Frederick a, uh, just a quick twist and he'd be cool. <laughs> because the, you know, to me, this, the metaphor is actually very simple. It's like, um, you know, just make it practical, <clears throat> like woodworking or, mm. or you know, his favorite yeah. sculpture. You know, Safrasent is to have built a skillfulness of relationship with the object to be able to actually flow with its natural texture. You know, Michelangelo yes. nails it, right? Mm -hmm. And you just say, okay, replace the stone with life, with the whole mm -hmm. of life, and that's it, right? You're, you're, you're done. Uh, it doesn't, hmm. it's not easy, right? It's a skillful relationship. It's actually building wisdom, right? Build, applying wisdom. It's building a, a, the naturalness. Like that's the problem, right? The problem is an assumption of a primordialness as opposed to a skillfulness. Yes. That it's, it's not the infant's naturalness in relationship to nature. It's the 
truly skillful, wise person's naturalness, that you have discovered a way of, of sort of co-creating with what nature is giving you. So you're the artist's uh, masterfulness. That's it. And, and that right, I mean, Joe, uh, John, I mean, we go back to our 11th problem of consciousness blog and your analysis, yeah. right, of the perspectival phenomenological, uh, you know, participatory grip of self in relationship to a world when individuals have that's transcendent experiences, right? Yeah, it's yeah. then coming into relation to the self and to the world and having a more fine groom flowing relationship with the stone with life. It's funny that we now enter, we now and go move to the, the sculpting image because now we've graduated from Stoicism to Neoplatonism because that was Plotinus's famous metaphor for his project of the, uh, of the, of the anagogic ascent. He said, huh. You, you, you're, you are basically a carved block of stone and you need to cut away, you need to carve away everything until you release the statue uh, within. That was his chosen metaphor uh, for describing this process. And, he, and, and so it's deeply resonant with everything you just said, George. And, and also what you just said, Greg, about, you know, how it, we now are, are talking about that, that, that Socrates can come into a kind of intensification when people are having these awakening and transcending experiences very much so all right check this shit out watch this so greg taking this the systems of justification mm -hmm. now drop drop in brother greg who's not present in this call but he's now present in a big way so i've got my jazz trumpeter okay uh -huh. and my jazz trumpeter is playing mm -hmm. but he's not cool which is to say he's hung up He's worried about whether his system of justification is being taken, right? Mm -hmm. How well am I doing? He's worried about what's happening. Of course, he's getting his own way. Yep. And you can feel it, right? It feels crunchy. It feels like it's not there. It's not loose. Mm -hmm. right? It's not cool. And then you got this other guy. This other guy is cool, which is critical, right? He's on the one hand, he is non-attached, right? So we can kind of bring in a little bit of the, of the, of the Eastern flair, right? He's, he's so good with what he's doing that he is no longer trying at all. And the effortlessness is part of the, the flood, right? But it's again, it's not some random jackass who doesn't know how to play the trumpet, right? right? That's also right. not attached, right? That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> nope. We're talking about somebody for whom the skillfulness of flowing allows him to actually get out of his own way and let the thing do the thing it's supposed to do without the least bit of concern for his interior or the other folks, which is a way of producing beautiful music. And then, of course, at Every once in a while, he'll stop. He'll kind of look around and be like, everybody's like, whoa, dude, that was awesome. It's like, all right, I don't know what just happened, but I'm going to keep working on that vibe because that's where it's at. Exactly. So, so and, and, and essentially then the mind three, that self-conscious mind three is sort of checking out and you're just in a perspectival participatory groove at an inner subjective, inter, usually an implicit <laughs> inner subjective way. But, yeah. but, but right. I think something else just came out of that, right? It sounded to me, Jordan, and I think that, that you're talking about now that there's, there's, there's two existential modes within the justification framework. There's an encratia mode, which is the one that we have taken as being paradigmatic, but there's also sophrosenic yep. Yep. mode of justification. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, it's sure enough. It. we're trying to seek that, right? Yeah. Yes. If we open up and we find that and you light and the shine light them through and there's the pathway. Boom. Yep. Yeah, and the cool thing is you can actually, you know when, they're, when you're there. Like there's a way of actually being there and feeling there. Like, you know, some basketball players will talk about notion of like when they're in the zone. Yeah, they can be aware of being in the zone. They, yeah, you got to be yeah, you real have, careful. Yeah, mm -hmm. you got to be real careful because right. you don't want to jack give yourself too out much of, of that zone. energy, and all of a sudden you jack yourself out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you just basically want that observer function, that narrative. All right, I'm just well. This guy's fucking on fire. Yeah, exactly. You're just like checking out, going, "Wow, I can't yeah, believe." I'm just watching this thing. <laughs> <laughs> but that uh, imagine that now being truly in the collective, right? Oh the my god, distributed. Right. right. And can That's you imagine I, the transformation between the chaos, the epileptic chaos and the collective insanity of psychosis that we were seeing versus the, ah! Yeah, yeah. I can, I can imagine yeah, well, that. Fingers crossed, right? <laughs> it's, it, it's interesting how it circles back in a way, because I mean, in one sense, we're talking upwards about sort of theologos and distributed cognition. But when, we get, when, you get the, when you get collective flow, right? You also get an altered state of consciousness. And, and right, and so it, it also that's what I meant about it reverberates back into, right. and, and many people go, I didn't know, and, and they have this weird anamnesis experience. They, they, this, you know, I've never been here. They say this paradoxical thing, I've never been here before, but this is truly who I am, which is like, what, right? But that to me, that's the hallmark 
of somebody trying to uh, articulate that they've just mm -hmm. gone through an aspirational burst, yeah. right? In, yep. in some huge way. Right. They felt the alignment. And then, of course, the crucial thing is to say, yeah, shh, don't throw words at it, man. Right. <laughs> but don't do that. That's, that's <laughs> just going to make a mess of things. Like, let's just, just let it be. Well, gentlemen, I think this is where we should let it be. This is a perfect time. <laughs> let it be. <laughs> All right. All right, guys. All right, guys. That was good. great jazzing. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, so um, if you guys want this for your channel or whatever, let me know. I'm going to upload oh, yeah. it at some point um, on Voices with Verveke because I think this was a gem. We just covered so much, and it just took off in so, so many ways. Yeah, do Actually, send me the raw link. I will actually upload it as its own object on my channel, because I'm interested in seeing, I think that actually creates a different. Yeah, yeah, it impact. does. It, we, the, uh, one uh, I just did, the one I just did with, um, with Paul and Jonathan, we've released it on all three channels. And, and yeah, you get a deal logo, so you get a meta deal logos thing happening, it's really cool. I'm setting awesome. up my channel, so and I'll be adding it whenever, so. Yep. Right okay, well, when, when, when you all know, good, so man. yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send you the file, Jordan. Yeah, all sounds right. good. Bye, I guys. really enjoyed it, guys. Yeah, that was okay. fun. Yeah, a lot of fun. Take care, guys.